Dunblane is also known for his ancient history, including a Roman road and what was believed to be a Roman fort, now home to the previously mentioned Dunblane Cathedral. The Dunblane Primary School was one of the largest primary schools in Scotland, with a total population of about 640 students. We'll be right back after these short messages. Mike was born in Glasgow on May 10, 1952. Just 18 months after his birth, his father ran off with another woman, leaving Mike and his mother alone. In 1955, three years later, his parents would officially divorce. After his parents' divorce, Mike moved in with his mom into his maternal grandparents' home in Cranhill, Glasgow. On November 26, 1956, Mike was adopted by his grandparents while his mother was still living in the same home. Mike was raised being told that his mother was his sister. In 1963, the entire family moved to Stirling, Scotland, and in 1968, Mike became an experienced draftsman. He would go on to be an apprentice draftsman in the county architect's office in Stirling. In 1972, Mike opened his own shop called Woodcraft, where he sold craft supplies and fitted kitchens. Thirteen years after opening Woodcraft, he decided to sell the shop, and he started receiving unemployment, as well as state benefits. During this time, Mike would start selling cameras and camera equipment, as well as doing some freelance photography. In July of 1973, Mike was a venture scout who was then appointed as an assistant scout leader of the 4th, 6th Sterling Troop. Mike never seemed to cause any problems at this time and was always willing to help others. In the fall of 1973, he was appointed leader of the 24th Stirlingshire Troop. It was around this time that many people started complaining about Mike's leadership skills. On one occasion, Mike told a couple of the boys to sleep with him in his van overnight in the cold weather. When he was questioned about this, Mike said that the hotel they were supposed to be at was overbooked and they had nowhere to go. The leadership committee told him to double-check hotel arrangements beforehand and was given a warning. Not long after, the same incident happened again. Mike gave the same excuse that the hotel had been double-booked and they didn't have anywhere to go. After further investigation into his story, it was found that Mike had never actually made a hotel room reservation. Mike would only take his favorite scouts on overnight trips. Of course, there was speculation that Mike was being inappropriate with the boys, but there was never any evidence, and the boys always said nothing inappropriate had happened on their trips. The district commissioner submitted a letter to the scout headquarters voicing his concerns about Mike. He said that Mike wasn't a good scout leader and was concerned about Mike's immaturity and irresponsibility. The commissioner asked that Mike be stripped of his scout leader role and that he not be involved with the scouts at all. At 22 years old, Mike was dismissed as a scout leader. In February of 1977, Mike asked the Scout Association to hold an inquiry hearing about a complaint he had filed with the association saying that he had been victimized. The request for an inquiry was denied. This didn't stop Mike, as he continued to write letters to the association, saying that they had ruined his good name and his reputation by terminating his appointment. After he was terminated from the Boy Scouts, he created and ran many different groups for boys starting in November of 1981. A few of the different groups were Dunblane Rovers Group, Lynburn Gymnastics Club, Dunfermline Boys Sports Club, and Denny Boys Club. These were just a few of the groups he had started. There were many, many more. The clubs were aimed for boys ages 7 to 11 and Mike said that his goal was to give the boys something to do to keep them off the street and give them a better childhood than he ever had. Some say that the exercises the boys were required to do were over-strenuous for their age. When questioned why he was the only one employed by these clubs, he told the concerned adults and parents that he was authorized to care for up to 30 boys at one time, something that wasn't true at all. Mike would be a little too curious about the backgrounds of the boys, wanting to know where they lived, and tried to learn about their family backgrounds. Something that also concerned parents was that the boys were required to wear black swim trunks that didn't fit well 
while taking gymnastics classes. The boys were also required to change their clothes in front of everyone, including Mike, and not in changing rooms. Mike would also take many, many photos of the boys in these shorts without their permission or the permission of their parents. In 1982, his adoptive father, his biological grandfather, moved to an assisted living place for the elderly. In 1987, Mike and his family moved into the home located on Kent Road mentioned at the beginning of this episode. Not long after moving into the home on Kent Road, his adopted mother, or biological grandmother, passed away. No one really knows if Mike was ever told that who he believed to be his sister was actually his biological mother. In 1989, Mike bought a video camera, which enabled him to film videos of the boys and not just take pictures. When questioned about the photos and videos, he stated that he would use them for training and advertising purposes. In the videos and photos, the boys never seemed to appear to be enjoying themselves or having any fun. He also kept a large collection of photos and videos of the boys on the walls of his home. He also kept a large collection of photos and videos of the boys, and the walls of his home were filled with these photos. There were so many photos, the neighbors could see them on the walls through the windows. The campers would call him Mr. Creepy, while all of the adults referred to him as Spock. There was something that seemed off about Mike, and he always made the boys feel uncomfortable. If he was ever questioned about the camps or the awful things that happened at these camps, he would immediately get defensive and aggressive. In September of 1995, there was a large decline in the attendance of his camps, until he finally decided to end them for good. These camps went on for 25 long, long years. There had been at least 12 complaints against Mike by parents of the campers, but there was never enough evidence to charge him with any sort of crime. I'm sure that he had delusions uh, of persecution. To some extent, of course, uh, people were suspicious of him, but he probably exaggerated this in his mind uh, so that he had uh, built up this hostile revenge scenario uh, with children being a major feature of it because uh, they were trying to keep him away from the children and he was demonstrating his potency by taking his guns down there and uh, showing what he could do to control children and perhaps get back at all the adults that had been coming between him and those children. In January of 1996, Mike started shooting at the Sterling Rifle and Pistol Club, Whitestone Range. It didn't take long for Mike to become obsessed with his guns, and he soon would have a large collection. Others would say that he used to stroke, or pet the guns, and talk to them as if they were his children. Mike had always been a rather odd man, but after he had discovered firearms and created a love and passion for them, his behavior declined rapidly. But in fact, at least two members of the club already knew him, or knew of him, uh, I think some way back, and they had already made up their minds before the disastrous events of yesterday that was, was his name to come up before the committee, they would actually reject him. Uh, we're a private club, we can take who we like, and uh, quite clearly, with two members who didn't like him, we were not going to have taken him. Uh, he did not become a member, and uh, there we are for the moment. Uh, just a sort of creepy feeling. Um, I think not only at the Rifle Club have we had that, but he tried to set up a youth group in Cullender, and parents there got a creepy feeling. They just didn't want to be anything to do with him, and um, in a private club uh, where we all know each other, we wouldn't have wanted anything to do with him either. His neighbors reported that he would creepily walk around the neighborhood with his coat on, hands in his pockets, and head down. He never spoke to his neighbors, or even acknowledged them. Because of the massacre in 1996, two new Firearms Acts were passed. The first was called the Firearms Amendment Act 1997, which banned all cartridge ammunition handguns except for 22 caliber single-shot weapons in England, Scotland, and Wales. Not long after the first act was passed, a second one was passed called the Firearms Amendment Act No. 2, 1997, which banned the remaining 22 caliber weapons. Six days after the shooting, on March 19, 1996, the shooter was cremated. A group was formed called the Gun Control Network, how does society deal with somebody who is on the margins but has never committed 
a, 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 a crime that can be actually seen by the legal system as, as a crime. Documents later would reveal that in 1991, complaints of assault, obstructing police, and child neglect were investigated by CPS, and no action had been taken due to lack of evidence. On April 11, 1996, the gym where most of the massacre had occurred was demolished and replaced with Memorial Garden in honor of the victims. On March 14, 1998, a memorial garden was opened at Dunblane Cemetery, including a fountain with a plaque listing all of the victims' names. If a more extensive investigation had been done on the complaints filed against Mike, could the shooting have been prevented? Perhaps. But this is something we will never know. Remember, if you see something out of the ordinary, then say something. You don't know how many lives you could be saving.